Okay, um, good afternoon everybody. Uh, welcome again to this uh, ERCnet ESPN webinar on uh, non-systematic uh, renal Fanconi syndrome. Uh, my name is Tom Nijnhuis, I'm an adult nephrologist from the Radboud University Medical Center in Nijmegen, the Netherlands. Um, but more importantly, our speaker of today is Francisco Emma, uh, whom you all probably already know, uh, uh, since he is also part of the Education Task Force and as such has been your moderator at numerous ERCnet webinars uh, before today. Um, Francesco Emma is the head of the Department of Pediatric Subspecialties, a division head of nephrology and dialysis at Bambino Gesù Children's Hospital in Rome. Um, and he actually received his medical degree from the Catholic University of Leuven, or Leuven in Dutch, um, uh, in Belgium, where he specialized in pediatrics and then subsequently completed his training in pediatric nephrology at Boston Children's Hospital, Harvard Medical School. And he moved to Bambino Gesù Children's Hospital in Rome in 1998 and was appointed head of the Pediatric Nephrology Division in 2005. Uh, Professor Zemmer's primary research uh, interests lie in, uh, of course, rare kidney disorders, uh, in particular cystinosis, Fanconi syndrome, as well as uh, nephrotic syndrome in children. Um, and he also specializes in designing clinical trials for rare kidney disorders uh, and as well as uh, preclinical studies. Um, before giving the floor to Francesco, um, uh, I would like to urge everybody to ask your questions in the questions uh, box, uh, so we can also have a lively discussion afterwards. Um, and with this, I would say, uh, Francesco, the floor is yours. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. And um, it's a pleasure to be here. So the topic today is non systematic renal Fanconi syndrome. Um, and what I will try to do is to give you an overview um, of how to um, approach these patients and um, of the possible diagnosis um, of when a patient has Fanconi syndrome. And so um, what we decided to do is actually to start with the questions. And we have three questions to sort of test the audience and then um, uh, I will give my presentation. So here's the first question, um, which is the first cause of Fanconi syndrome in the first year of life. And you have four options, tyrosinemia, cystinosis, then disease, and lower syndrome. So I guess, Tom, I will not be able to see the answer, so it will if, probably... If you are not seeing anything now, then you will not be able, so <laughs> so yeah. I will, uh, uh, after the voting is done, I will uh, um, you have tell to you read. what... Yeah. Uh, we'll read it to you, yeah. So we will give people a little bit more time to think about this. Um, still see votes coming in. I guess now we're about to. Uh... So the results, uh, Francesco, are 25% uh, of the people said it's tyrosinemia, uh, two thirds of people said it's cystinosis, and then there are uh, a couple of people that uh, have uh, suggested dense or low uh, uh, disease as uh, the first cause of Fanconi syndrome. Okay, so the answer here is fairly. Uh... Um, clear. Actually, the answer is cystinosis. So, um, and I wanted to put this question because I will talk about everything but cystinosis. Um, so remember, the first cause of Fanconi syndrome in the first year of life is nephropathic cystinosis. This is the second question, which is the most constant, constant finding in Fanconi syndrome? And, and you can include also partial form of GRC because in the full Fanconi syndrome, you have everything. But which is the most frequent, uh, constant finding? Is it renal tubular acidosis? Is it low molecular weight proteinuria? Is it glycosuria? Is it phosphaturia? Okay, I'm launching the poll. I see that everybody is very fast in answering. So this one is maybe easier. Okay. Still some folks coming in. 
and now close the poll. Now, um, so Francesco, uh, we have uh, a winner with almost 50% uh, of uh, uh, um, uh, people saying low molecular weight proteinuria, 37% uh, saying renal tubular acidosis, and 9% glycosuria, 6% phosphaturia. Okay, so this was a more tricky question, and I'm not even sure that there is a, a unique answer, but uh, for the reason that I will show you, in a moment, I would also say that low molecular weight proteinuria is probably the one thing that you should always find, at least at a certain degree, in Fanconi syndrome. Obviously, it also becomes a question of definition and to and to and to be and to agree on what we call Fanconi, at least partial forms of Fanconi syndrome. But I think that um, it, low molecular weight proteinuria really goes to the heart of the dysfunctional proximal tubular cell. And then the last question um, here is, which types of genes usually do not cause Panconi syndrome? Um, and um, um, the answer that I offer to you are gene encoding for apical transporters, gene encoding for basolateral transporters, genes encoding for mitochondria proteins, gene encoding for mitochondria tRNAs. Okay, I'm launching the poll. Voting on this one is a little bit slower than the uh, previous two. <laughs> People are still casting their votes. Now, I think we have all the votes that we're gonna get. Um, and this is not so clear cut <laughs> as the uh, previous two ones. Uh, so 39% uh, say uh, mitochondrial tRNAs. Uh, do not cause uh, Fanconi syndrome. 32% of people say basolateral transporters, 23% say apical transporters, and 6% say mitochondrial proteins. Okay. <laughs> All right. So uh, my answer to this question is actually the apical transporters, um, and I will discuss this in a moment. So let's let's get started here. So um, um, I'm starting usually when I give this talk with this uh, this um, this picture of uh, sodium reabsorption along the, the nephron. And um, actually, the one thing that I just wanted to stress is that in the proximal tubule we have um, sodium couple transporters, and just to give you. Uh, sometimes we don't really have a sense about how much sodium do we uh, reabsorb every day. But um, you can see here the calculation that we made and uh, um, that I made. Um, and these 17,000 millimoles per day of sodium um, really correspond to about one kilogram of salt. So this gives you a sense of the amount of work that the proximal tubular does. And it does so um, using this expanded apical membrane, um, which is composed of the classical brush border of proximal tubules, uh, which is really essential to have enough surface to reabsorb all this sodium. And so, um, as uh, you know, the, the, these, these transporters are sodium couple transporters. Um, and the energy comes from the sodium potassium ATPase. Um, and uh, up to the amphibians in the evolutions, you also had the sodium chloride co-transporter. The problem with this is that there is so much sodium, uh, there is so much chloride that uh, basically all the energy for reabsorbing the sodium, or at least a lot of it, is actually driven by the transport of chloride. So in mammalians, we no longer have a sodium chloride co-transporter. Chlorides um, actually are transport, 
uh, paracellular in a paracellular way so that all the energy is driven really to reabsorb in a sodium couple uh, fashion um, everything that needs to be reabsorbed in the proximal tubule. And so along the proximal tubule, the osmolarity remains stable. That is because um, aquaporin 1 is expressed. So um, as you reabsorb solute, the water moves in the same direction, but chloride um, uh, concentration progressively increase up to a moment where the electrochemical gradient um, does not um, allow for chloride reabsorption, whereas you see that along the proximal tubule, um, everything which is sodium coupled is very efficiently um, reabsorbed, really because all the energy of the sodium potassium antipase is used to reabsorb in a sodium couple fashion all these solutes. And um, there are a number of them and um, some of them are illustrated here. There are co-transporters, there are symporters, there are exchangers, but at the end of the day, sodium is the major force to reabsorb all these solutes. And in parallel to this, um, the second thing that proximal tubule, the second mean that the proximal tubule uses to reabsorb um, um, uh, proteins that are filtered um, and these are small protein, low molecular weight proteins, as receptor-mediated endocytosis. Um, and we'll come back to this, but suffice it to say for the moment that the receptor binds for the ligand is transported in the endolysosomal compartment and the receptor is then recycled to the apical membrane. But this um, complex trafficking uh, organization of the proximal tubular cells has two characteristics. The first one is that obviously it's a polarized system. And the second one is that um, it uh, also allows um, for the, it's, uh, it, the, the cell trafficking uh, system is necessary also for the normal expression in the apical and in the basolateral aspect of cells of all the transporter that are illustrated here on the left side um, of this slide. So the two systems actually interact with each other. So the, the, the Fanconi syndrome, now you will find it as Fanconi renal tubular syndrome in the omen is actually, was actually initially called the Daytoni debray fanconi syndrome because these three uh, physicians actually describe these patients with renal glycosuria, with rickets, with a nephropathy um, in the 1930s with these four seminal papers. And um, it was for a long time called the Tony debris Fanconi syndrome and progressively um, um, uh, only the Fanconi uh, part of the of the name remain, and it's really now called Reno Fanconi syndrome to distinguish it from um, the Fanconi anemia. Um, so back to the proximal tubular uh, cell. This is sort of a cartoon that shows uh, the various aspects that I just uh, showed you. Reabsorption of bicarbonate is a little bit more complex, but at the end of the day, um, it's always the same driving force. You can see here water, which is transported through aquaporin uh, one, chloride, which is reabsorbed paracellularly, as well as calcium and the low molecular weight protein area. So if uh, the whole system here needs the expression um, and the translation of all these transporters, and it requires energy. So if you have isolated apical transport defect, you usually don't have renal Fanconi syndrome. If you uh, lack Airbat, for example, you will have cystinuria. If you are lacking some specific amino acid transporter, you will have selective aminocyuria. If you are mutated in S glut, you uh, protein in, in glut protein, you will have uh, glycosuria, and so on and so forth. So the cell is not compromised the function of the cell because you're lacking an apical transport, and this gives you an answer to the questions. When uh, you have a basolateral transport defect, then sometimes you do have Fanconi syndrome. Oftentimes it's not um, a, a full Fanconi syndrome, 
Um, an example of this, for example, is lysinuric protein intolerance, where um, you have the basolateral uh, transporter for neutral amino acid that doesn't work. And these amino acids actually accumulate within the cells and somehow they uh, compromise normal functioning of the cell. If you have mutation of transcription factors, surprisingly, it's very rare to have Fanconi syndrome. And um, we don't really know exactly why, but potentially it's because these uh, would be uh, too severe for, uh, for the cell to be viable, but there are some um, examples. On the other hand, if you have energy depletion, whether it's because you have a direct mitochondrial defect or because you have a metabolic cause, then frequently the cell will not work and the entire cell will function will be compromised and you have uh, Fanconi syndrome. And finally, if you have impaired receptor-mediated endocytosis, um, if the mutation is in the receptor, you usually don't have Fanconi syndrome. You have selective losses of low molecular weight proteinuria. I will say a few words about that. But if you have a, a, a compromise of the intracellular trafficking defect, then usually you have Fanconi syndrome because all these transporters cannot be expressed uh, uh, adequately. Cell polarity will be compromised and low molecular weight proteinuria will not be reabsorbed. So I think that. Um, this scheme is nearly always correct, and I think it's a very useful way of thinking about Fanconi syndrome. Just a few words to remind you that not all causes of Fanconi syndrome are uh, genetic, and that um, you may have a number of toxic agents, especially drugs, that can cause, uh, that can compromise the function of the proximal cell, but this is really not the argument of my talk. So if we go to uh, genetic forms of Fanconi syndrome, um, you first have metabolic disease. And this list is nearly complete, but it's not full. Um, and um, from the metabolic perspective, uh, some of them are classical uh, um, uh, etiologies of Fanconi syndrome, but I must say that most of the time, the other symptoms are much more overt. So the Fanconi syndrome is not the presenting symptom, like galactosemia, where you have a liver disease, uh, cataract, the encephalopathy, vomiting and diarrhea, fructose intolerance, which usually manifests with hypoglycemia, vomiting and liver disease. We will talk about tyrosinemia. Wilson disease usually doesn't give uh, an open Fanconi syndrome, but there's some form uh, that may present with Fanconi syndrome, especially at later age, and then mitochondrial cytopathies. And then you have membrane transporter and transcription factor. In Fanconi uh, Bico, you have mutation of the GLUT transporter, so GLUT1 and GLUT2 are on the basolateral aspects of the membrane, and S-GLUT1 and S-GLUT1 are the apical transporter, the one with the large um, with the, um, uh, conductance and the one with, the, uh, with high affinity, which is the S-GLUT transporter. And in fanconi Beco syndrome, patients have hypoglycemia, liver disease, and failure to thrive, and rickets, um, and they can have uh, a Fanconi syndrome. And here is the basolateral transporter, which is mutated. Um, in lysinuric protein intolerance, uh, patients have failure to thrive, uh, hepatosplenomegaly, respiratory failure, and immunological disorders, and you have the basolateral amino acid transport. I Think, I apologize for this. I think it's a neutral amino acid transporter, but I'm not 100% sure. And my apologies if I'm wrong on that. I need to check it. And then there is one autosomal dominant Fanconi syndrome that has been described in mutation in this transcription factor, HNF4 alpha, but it's this specific mutation that has been reported. Usually, uh, the other mutations actually. Uh, do not cause the Fanconi syndrome. And these patients have MOD1, uh, MOD1 um, they're macrosomic and neonatal hyperinsulinism. And then you have a situation where the receptor mediator endocytosis is compromised in Imerslund Grasbach syndrome, in Dane Bogo syndrome, mutations are in the receptors. 
and then cystinosis, lower syndrome, then disease. I will, uh, uh, I will mention them. I will not talk about cystinosis, but I will get back to this um, in my slides. And I will not talk about the mutations in these um, two proteins, which are essential for normal intracellular trafficking. These patients have ARC syndrome. They are born with contractures of joints, cholestasis, ichthyosis. They can have central nervous system malformation and plethora abnormalities. So remember, if you have a patient with cholestasis, with Vancouver syndrome, joint contractures, ichthyosis, think about heart syndrome. It's very rare. I've seen one in my life, uh, but it's one of the, um, um, the uh, etiologists of Vancouver syndrome. And then finally, when you don't find any of these causes, you call this an idiopathic Falcone syndrome, which is a very elegant way of saying that we have not understood uh, what goes on. So um, this is the proximal tubular cells. And as you can see, one of its characteristics in addition to the uh, brush border is that it's so rich in mitochondria. And um, not surprisingly, uh, when you have a mitochondrial cytopathy, um, you can have a Fanconi syndrome. And I will not expand more um, on that. In some cases, you have partial forms. Sometimes you have isolated you know, tubular acidosis, aminoaciduria, isolated hypomagnesemia, or sometimes even a Barcelona-like phenotype that's been described. But it's clearly one of the causes of Fanconi syndrome. There have been some genetic families that have been described. Um, and usually there are isolated cases like this family with an autosomal form. In this case, this protein, which I will not pronounce, but which is normally expressed in the peroxisome, is mistargeted in the respiratory um, chain and it compromises normal uh, mitochondrial function. Usually this is not a severe Fanconi syndrome, um, simply because it's also autosomal dominant. And as usual, autosomal dominant disease tend to be less severe with, um, with variable uh, penetration. Um, and there is another family that have been um, described. Um, um, this is a receptive disease and it's in, in, in Acadia, in Nova Scotia, in Canada. It was described a long time ago, but the molecular defect has been described more recently. And it also affects this protein, which is an NADH ubiquinone oxoreductase complex assembly factor. Um, and at the end of the day, it compromises the, the uh, function of mitochondria, it oxidizes mitochondria also. Um, and this protein is also expressed in pulmonary epithelia, so patients also um, have uh, respiratory uh, symptoms. Um, now, one thing that I would mention about mitochondrial cytopathies is this, is that when the respiratory chain doesn't work, you accumulate an ADH in the mitochondria, in the, in the, mitochondria, um, in the mitochondria, and the excess of an ADPH has some consequences. One is to drive this reaction from acetoacetate to 3-hydroxybutyrate. And the second one is to convert uh, 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 glucose into pyruvate. Part of it will actually generate lactate. Um, so if you look at the organic acid of a patient with a mitochondrial cytopathies, one thing that you often see is that you see a peak of 3-hydroxybutyrate and a 3 of pyruvate. And these are signature that something in the respiratory chain doesn't work. You may see lactate, and you actually frequently see it when you have um, a, a Fanconi syndrome, whereas you don't see it when you have a mitochondrial glomerular disease, uh, but it's not 100% of cases. And sometimes you also see 5-oxoproline because the gamma glutamine cycle um, requires ATP to function. The upstream metabolite is oxoproline. So when you have 5-oxoproline, that means that your tubular cells are lacking ATP. And then the other thing that you can see if you do a biopsy, which we never do, is this very abnormal mitochondria in the proximal tubular cell, the lack of a brush border, and these uh, very abnormal cells. So another form of Fanconi syndrome that has been described recently, this is from this year, is this Fanconi syndrome with deafness. In this case, the protein 
which is um, abnormal is this protein which is involved in the fission of endocytic tubules and it's a protein which is essential for the recycling of vesicle to the apical membrane um, and here we are moving uh, to uh, this uh, receptor mediated endocytosis defects um, um, and uh, what you see in these patients as in all patients that have a defect in receptor mediated endocytosis is that they don't capture the DMSA when you do a nuclear scan because DMSA is reabsorbed um, in the same process that is used for low molecular weight proteinuria reabsorption. Um, this protein is also uh, present in the inner ear and these patients um, actually have deafness. Um, and then um, uh, uh, in the same line, um, um, uh, I promised to you that I will talk about tyrosinemia type 1, which is very interesting. In tyrosinemia type 1, um, there are three forms of tyrosinemia. The one that we are interested in is the subacute form, which present with an hepatomegaly, a coagulopathy failure to try, Fanconi syndrome, very often recurrent, and um, if less than try uh, untreated patients have neurological crisis. And you see here an example of these patients with rickets. You see this very uh, lobulated and um, irregular uh, uh, liver that sometimes you can palpate. And if you don't treat these patients, they develop a hepatoblastoma. Um, these patients have high concentrations of thyrosinemia, obviously. Um, and you recognize them because they have very, very high concentration of alpha fetoprotein. So this is really the test you need to do when you have Fanconi syndrome that usually don't present in the first year of life. Typically, they will present when they are two, three, or four years old. In the urine, you will find tyrosine metabolite, um, um, hydroxyphenyl pyruvate, uh, hydroxyphenyl um, um, act, uh, lactate, and um, uh, hydroxyphenyl um, acetate, which are very easily distinguished we, uh, found when you do um, uh, when you look uh, for organic acid. What is more interesting is what caused the disease. And uh, there are three forms of thyroidinemia actually, and this is the metabolic chain uh, that goes down to acetoacetate and fumarate. Um, and we have uh, animal models that have really um, teach us a lot on what is really toxic in this disease. So if you block this uh, last reaction um, with uh, the uh, fumaryl uh, fum uh, acetase, um, then uh, um, the mutation is basically lethal. But if you do, uh, and what happens in this case is that this animal accumulates succinyl acetate. On the other hand, if you have a double knockout mouse where uh, the reaction is blocked at this level, so it's a combination of tyrosine and may have type 3 and type 1, then these animals have basically no liver and no renal disease. But if you take these animals and you add homogenetisate, then they will develop Fanconi syndrome. So it's really the succinyl acetone, which is the culprit here, and which causes the Fanconi syndrome. And we know this also by a number of experiments in vitro that I will not detail. We know that in vivo, if you inject in rats, um, succinyl acetone will cause Fanconi syndrome. And more importantly, when you do a liver transplantation in these patients, as the succinyl acetone levels goes down, the renal tubular acidosis is also corrected. And this is the basis of treatment of these patients because these patients can be treated by NTDC, which blocks this reaction. And by blocking this reaction, you block the production of succinyl acetone. These are some of our patients, and you can see that the TMP of a GFR, so the renal threshold for phosphate, increases. And you see here in these patients, this increase in TNP of a GFR that parallels with a decrease in succinyl acetone. So back to the low molecular weight proteinuria. I think that to this audience, I don't need to, ex to explain that, um, these, uh, that this process is operated by cubulin and megalin. Cubulin is expressed with the abnormal protein that is essential to express on the cell membrane cubulin. And um, importantly, both of them 
um, uh, bind um, albumin. So it's normal to see proteinuria of albuminuria in these patients because 5% of the albumin is still filtered from the glomerulus. And then there are specific binders of cubulin like APO um, A1 and much more, many more binders for uh, megalin. So when we look at the urine of these patients, we, um, and this is a mistake that I've always, uh, that I often see, is that um, when you have Fanconi syndrome, uh, you do have, and pay attention to the fact that this scale is a logarithmic scale, you do have a lot of low molecular weight proteinuria, but you do also have some um, uh, albuminuria, and this is normal. This doesn't rule out um, the fact that it's a tumor disorder. It doesn't say that it's a glomerular disorder. Um, these are the levels of the carriers, for example, then disease. In glomerular disease, what happens is that you have much more albuminuria than low molecular weight proteinuria. This is really what makes the difference, and these are the normal subjects. So here are the diseases that at different levels of this very complex system um, will cause low molecular weight proteinuria. So you have the mutation of cubulin and megalin, which are the Dane-Borre and Emerson Grasbank syndrome, cystinosis that is uh, primarily but not only a lysosomal disease, lower uh, syndrome that impairs at different levels the entire recycling machinery, including at the community level, and um, in early endosomes, and you have then disease which affect early endosomes. Um, ARC syndrome is important, uh, it's called by this protein that are important vacuolar uh, sorting, and then um, basically any severe pro proximal tumor cytopathy will impair the system and cause low molecular weight proteinuria. So immersum grass pack syndrome is called by is caused by mutation in this true protein, cubulin and onion less. And I remember you that this protein is also the intestinal intrinsic factor, which is essential for vitamin B12 reabsorption. So this disorder is characterized by megaloblastic anemia that is responsive to parental vitamin B12 therapy, but also um, to pharmacological doses of enteral B12 therapy. It was first described in Finland and Norway where there are hotspots. Um, and patients usually are not symptomatic. Sometimes they have some failure to thrive. I think it's mostly if they're not recognized early enough to be supplemented. Um, there are some reporting showing that they may be more prone to some infection, gastrointestinal and respiratory infections. And some patients have some mild neurological symptom. Again, I think it's essential to recognize them rapidly. Here is an example of a patient. You see um, um, a patient of ours that had this cubulin mutation. And here uh, we had a biopsy. You can see in the urine that they are losing apo uh, and protein one here. The, 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 the picture is not very clear, but they don't use retinal binding protein and B. Uh, to microglobulins because these are ligands of cubulin. And you can see here the lack of expression of cubulin and onion less. And, um, and you see that APOA1 is not absorbed by the proximal tubule, whereas megalin is normally expressed and retinal binding protein is normally reabsorbed. In megalin mutations, you have done a borrow syndrome. Um, this is a barrier syndrome. Patients have these abnormal fascias with these abnormal features, um, these what's at highs. Um, they have how, uh, outer corners pointing downwards. Uh, they have this short uh, nose with this flat nasal bridge. Um, they have severe myopia. Uh, sometimes they have retinal detachment um, and sometimes may have even a coloboma. Um, they can have a sensor uh, neural hearing loss um, and obviously low molecular weight proteinuria. And there are some um, neurological feature. So many, very often these patients have a developmental delay. And it's, these are caused by megalin mutation. Um, and this is an example of two siblings that we had, which actually a very mild phenotype, 
uh, what these patients they had is a very severe myopia and, and very little else. And here you can see the lack of expression of megaline. And in this case, these patients losing the urea retinal binding protein, alpha-1 and beta-2 microglobulins, which are ligands of megaline. But megaline and cubulin are not only not expressed because you have a mutation in the receptor, but any uh, disease that will cause um, a defect in, low, in, 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 in the intracellular recycling will eventually uh, cause an impairment of the expression of these receptors. And so you will have uh, proteinuria in these disease. And you have here, ex example, for cystinose is lower than to Sjogren. And when you have defect in this whole machinery, you also like the expression of other transporters. And for this reason, you can also have in this disease, for example, phosphaturia, and these are um, examples. Um, and so um, one of the striking things in, um, in these disorders is that some may actually have some phenotypic overlaps. And we know, for example, that um, mutation in CRCM5 plus then one disease, which may be indistinguishable from DEN2 disease, whereas OCR1 mutation can cause both DEN2 and lower disease. And I will just simply finish in by uh, not going through the whole phenotype of these diseases by simply um, um, discussing with you some differences with, between, um, between DENT1 and DENT2, between DENT2 and Lowe syndrome. Um, and um, here are, uh, for example, summarized features that you can find in DENT1 and DENT2 syndrome. Many of them are very similar. Um, they all have low molecular weight proteinuria. Here again, pay attention to the fact that the scale here is logarithmic. It sort of gives you a sense that alpha-1 microglobulin and retinal binding protein are more sensitive than beta-2 microglobulin. Again, this is milligram. These are not millimoles, uh, but uh, these proteins all are low molecular weight proteinuria, so they proteins that they, they have similar molecular weights and uh, um, and, and, and I think it was interesting to, to notice this. So if we compare these two, um, you see that low molecular weight proteinuria per definition is present in every uh, patient, but um, there are some features which are clearly much more expressed in one and not in the other. For example, nephrocalcinosis is more frequent in that one disease as well as hypercalciuria. Um, renal hyperuricemia is more present in DEN2 disease. So basically the functioning of the proximal cell is more compromised in DEN2 um, disease overall. So you have feature of Fanconi syndrome that sometimes are more frequent here. Um, glycosuria, on the other hand, for reasons that we don't understand, is extremely rare in OCR1 mutations. And if present, um, it's actually of low entity. It's more frequent in the one disease. Failure to thrive is usually more severe um, in the um, in the um, um, I apologize. Um, okay. So um, the other thing which is characteristic in this uh, disease is that there is a urinary concentration defect in nearly 100% of cases when they are tested. And in DEN2 disease, um, you have increased LDH and CPK um, because it's a more generalized disease. Um, also, DEN1 and DEN2 have a decline of renal function, which is very similar, but which is less steep than the decline that you observe in lower syndrome. And then if we now compare lower syndrome and then two diseases which are caused by mutation in the same gene, there are some, um, some differences. Um, for example, both cases have uh, elevated CPK and LDH, but these are much more pronounced in lower syndrome. They all have low molecular weight proteinuria. And as you can see, Glycosuria is actually usually um, of low entity and it's uh, relatively rare. But for example, cataract is always present in lower syndrome. If present in DEN2 disease, it's very limited. 
intellectual impairment is not severe in them to disease and sometimes is absent. Um, and these patients with lower syndrome are much more growth retarded than patients with them to disease. And from the renal tubular um, uh, uh, perspective, um, usually um, we see that the Fanconi syndrome is uh, more complete in lower syndrome and it tends to be more partial um, in than to uh, disease. And this correlates in the progression of CKD, which is uh, faster in patients with lower syndrome compared to them to disease. And we still don't clearly understand why these phenotypes are so different. Um, certainly what is clear is that in them to disease, mutations are clustered in the first part of the protein um, where the pH domain uh, lies. And if patients have mutation in the rest of the protein, usually these are missense mutations, whereas mutations and, um, in then uh, two disease are clustered in these other domains of the protein, especially in the uh, phosphatidine phosphatase 5 uh, phosphatase um, domain um, of the protein, as well as these patients often have deletion of the gene. And with this, um, I have uh, finished. Uh, let me simply remind you uh, before, uh, if we have time for questions, that um, we'll have uh, three webinars um, in October and November. Um, the next one will be given by Franz Schaefer on rare disease aspect of pediatric dialysis. Um, uh, uh, Burkhard Tomshoff will talk to us about challenges in kidney transplantation in infants. And finally, uh, Paul Coppo will um, give a talk on thrombotic thrombocytopenia purple. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, um, Francesco. Um, ah, now, now we see you again. <laughs> um, uh, I am waiting uh, for the question box to fill. Um, so first of all, uh, um, uh, uh, I would like the uh, to ask you, uh, and because maybe that's not clear to to everybody, um, and it uh, went by uh, fast. But but uh, why why do we expect a urinary concentration defect in a proximal tubular disorder? Because maybe not everybody um, uh, relates uh, urinary concentration defect with proximal tubular. Well, um, actually, you know, there's there's two sides of this. The first one is that. Obviously, when you don't reabsorb, uh, there are solutes in, 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 in the tubular lumen, and this solute will compromise your osmotic gradient um, in the distal tubule. But in dent one disease, um, you also have uh, a defect, which is also in the ascending limb, um, because the CLC5 protein is also expressed there by mechanisms that we don't clearly understand that you know this better than I do, so feel free to comment. And so there is also a more distal, uh, probably, um, effect that has to do also with the calciuria that these patients have. Now, when you have a, a, a more generalized disease like in mitochondrial cytopathies, what we need to also remember is that disease is not only the proximal tubule, it's simply that the proximal tubule does 80% of the work uh, of the nephron, and so the Fanconi syndrome will be the most, um, the most, um, uh, the, the, the foremost uh, uh, aspect of this disease, but the defect is actually extended also to a more distal aspect of the nephron. So I don't know if you want to comment, uh, uh, Tom, um, if you want to. I think that you, th that you described it very clearly. I have nothing to, uh, <laughs> uh, to add in that sense. Um, the, the other thing that I was wondering, uh, seeing all these um, uh, names of uh, diseases coming by, should we actually look for a new nomenclature of this? Because it, it also seems very uh, complicated because of all the different names um, yeah. and syndromes. Yeah. <laughs> Do I, you have an idea about that? <laughs> I, I don't know. I just... Uh... It's probably, I mean, the, the, I think the most, yeah, I mean, we, we can try to simplify that and just to, you know, if you look in the OMIN database, actually, they've started to do it, it you have um, 
for example, the Canadian uh, form, I think it's the, um, the, 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 the renal tubular syndrome type 5. So that so so that there, that there there are some there have been some attempts, but I think it's these are simply um, um, I think there is a need to just uh, as you say come so get together with experts and try to 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 agree on a common nomenclature. Um, but so far um, this is how we call that. Um, yeah. yeah, because I think already well, I think, only in, in the lows and dense uh, um, uh, situation there you I think that from a nephrological perspective you would you would call it differently, right? Well, you would find it as Oclosurimorino syndrome, and um, um, I mean, yeah, I mean it, it clearly can be simplified. What I think it's honestly, honestly, I think it's it's useful is to have this um, physiopathological classification in your mind. Um, it's not an apical transporter. Apical transporter will cause cystinuria, heart node disease, glycosuria. They will not cause Fanconi syndrome. Mm -hmm. uh, anything that compromises the metabolism or the energy um, of the proximal tubular cells can disrupt the entire cell uh, function of whatever disrupt the the intracellular recycling will cause a Fanconi syndrome. I think that thinking in these lines helps a lot in trying to think about what causes the disease. I have one question in the uh, in the question box, uh, which uh, uh, first of all thanks you for the for the great presentation, um, and ask whether there's any knowledge of genetic tubular defects related to hypermagnesemia and not hypomagnesemia. Um, well, uh, when the doctor says, I have two siblings uh, with that from my consensuous Afghan uh, parents. Um, I don't know whether that specifically is also, uh, maybe this person can comment in the question box whether this there is also a Fanconi syndrome here, but... I think this, I, I think this is a question for you. Tom is one yeah. of the most biggest expert in magnesium transport so i will not answer this question this is a question for you tom yeah, yeah I, I would think if if uh, uh, I, I would directly uh, think about this claudin 10 mutation so this helix syndrome uh, uh, patients but of course it it, um, uh, it it clearly depends on the rest of the phenotype that these uh, patients uh, uh, would have i am actually not aware of uh, specific proximal tubular defects leading to Fanconi syndrome and hypermagnesemia. Um, um, another question that popped up in my uh, mind uh, when you talked about this this um, uh, mutation, which you did not pre pronounce, but the AHHADH uh, mutation, uh, where you said, "Yeah, well, it's it's an autosomal dominant disorder and." Uh, it might be uh, a bit more mild, uh, but also uh, of variable penetrance. D do you know of a clear variable penetrance in in this? Uh, oh, actually, um, I, I actually said it by. I, if I if I don't re if I remember well the paper, what, what what struck me is that the Fanconi was not very severe, and there was some variability. So, and I just made a, a general comment that usually when you have autosomical mm -hmm dominant diseases, um, um, they tend to be milder than autosomal recessive diseases uh, because they don't have to, I mean, they require at least not to compromise uh, fertility. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and for that reason, oftentimes, I mean, in renal diseases, we see that the penetrance can be very variable. Um, it was more genetic, but I remember that in the paper, I was struck mm -hmm. by the fact that it was not a very severe Fanconi syndrome, and that uh, the severity was um, was um, was not homogeneous in the various situations. Yeah, yeah, we, we actually have a family uh, in Nijmegen who, who uh, harbors a mutation in this gene, which also has a renal Fanconi syndrome, but some of the family members also have a mitochondrial phenotype. 
Um, yeah. But but there is a, there is one uh, subject in the family with the same mutation which has absolutely no phenotype, and that's actually why I, I was struck by your comment. <laughs> So uh, we, we, we actually have um, one family that has no Fancoma syndrome and has a mutation in that gene and has a clinic which is more a clinic of mitochondrial cytopathy. So okay. maybe we should actually... Maybe we should talk. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm looking whether there are any additional questions uh, in, in the uh, question uh, box. Actually, there seem to be none apart from uh, people thanking you and uh, um, telling that you gave an excellent talk uh, so i guess that 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 is for now the best conclusion uh, uh, of today uh, that uh, oh i'm still uh, seeing one coming in um so the question is, do we have to add LDH and CK on the tubular? Um, so I, I, I think the, the question is, um, uh, the sentence doesn't go any further, but the question is probably whether we should ask LDH and CK if oh, yeah. we look at yeah. tubular patients. Yeah, it's easy to do. It's easy mm -hmm. to do. Um, and if you have a, a muscular defect that you have, for example, lower syndrome or then do, disease, they will tend to have higher levels of CPK and LDH. Actually, lower syndrome, they all have it, but lower patient, you don't distinguish them because of this. You know, there are very characteristic features of them, but also in mitochondrial cytopathies, you can have some uh, increased LDH or CPK. I usually ask them. I mean, it's, um, I think it's a good idea to ask them. It gives us some clues sometimes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much um, again, <laughs> um, uh, and I would suggest uh, uh, to end this uh, webinar at this moment, uh, wishing everybody a, a good afternoon, and again pointing towards the next uh, ErgNet webinar at the 18th of October on uh, rare disease aspects of pediatric dialysis. Again, uh, Francesco, thank you for the, uh, for the excellent talk and everybody for um, uh, being here and asking questions. Thank you. Bye-bye.